a lot. How the fuck do you think they did this? Look, I, I just take a wild, wild ass guess. I think there's connections, possibly to 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 gravity manipulation. I think anti gravity had to have it play a part in moving some of this stuff. I actually think there's some connections to some of the the work that's being done with this um, plasmoid implosion technology. The the stuff that Randall's been looking into that's coming back to, to, to talk a little bit about the relationship and the, the sacred geometry aspects of that are, the, are similar to the things that we see in some of these cultures in the past. So that may potentially have something to do with the methods they, that, that were used in the past. But I'm convinced it was a form of advanced technology. Now, whether it's our form of technology, because let's face it, we can do things like that today, but it takes hydraulics and diesel powers and cranes and all that stuff. They may have had an, an entirely different avenue of, of, of tech and that you open up into the realm of resonance and acoustics and anti-gravity. I think uh, resonance in particular might be might have had a, played a strong role because that's certainly a feature that you see in some of these oldest structures, whether it's an accident or not, but some of them are incredibly resonant. The Great Pyramid generates a, a tone just on its own that comes from the earth in there. Um, it generates a tone. It does. In it de- generates a low tone. It's just, it's basically you, you coming from You can hear it earth. or is it? If you're quiet enough, you can, but it's certainly been picked up in a whole number of different experiments where they're measuring uh, the tone. It does, the whole structure does generate a low tone. Um, it's an interesting thing. You, a lot of these places that typically have a connection to underground water as well. Like we know there's water beneath the Giza Plateau, places like the Coricancha in Peru, which is also a giant megalithic building. There's an underwater river near there. Uh, we always see some form of, of flowing water associated with it, whether or not that has something to do with it. I don't know. But it's it's just in that realm of, I think it's the answers lay in realms of science that are outside of our current understanding that we should be approaching with an open mind because we might ultimately learn something from it if we do. We Instead of just dismissing it, putting it in a box and said, you know what, we're, we're superior to every civilization that's lived before. Right. They're primitive. They did it with primitive methods. Right, Done. right. All things are a frequency. All things operate on resonance. Um, and by the way, a quick little bizarre similarity when you're mentioning anti-gravity, that Dr. Chan yeah. Thomas, who wrote the Adam and Eve story, he was researching anti-gravity for McDonnell Doug- Douglas back in the 60s. Mm, listen, <laughs> so, Jamie, put that back up, please. A recent study published on Ancient Origins website claims that the ancient Egyptians benefited from the sound in the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza and relied on the discovery of a dead end in the rock inside the pyramid room as a tube of acoustic resonance that generates ultrasonic waves at a base frequency within 5 hertz. This raises the questions of the importance of ultrasound for the ancients, and can we find the use of sound waves between ancient cultures elsewhere in the world? Wow. Yeah, all the boxes too. The Serapium is an incredible site that that houses like twenty five of the biggest stone boxes you'll ever see. It's just one spot, and they're the biggest ones. They're like some of them are up to like seventy tons with their lids thirty tons, and we've I've been there with some people that have been measuring like the frequency resonance range inside there. So what range are you generating standard uh, standing waves? And they all seem to have a very similar resonance tone to them. Um, so it's it's an interesting experiment. Like you can you can stand inside a water tank or a concrete room and find a resonance. But it's it's uh, it's it's interesting to go and actually analyze those aspects of these ancient structures and to speculate maybe has this got anything to do with what they were made for? Because these are giant precision made boxes made from cyanite and granite. Mm that are perfectly flat and square and they're just massively solid. They went to tremendous effort to, to remove imperfections from the stone, no cracks, almost like they didn't want the damn things to shake apart or vibrate. Um, well, it's I, just the sheer scale of them. Like, oh, the, it, it, f- it flies in the face of logic. Like the, really the actual archaeologists that want to lock this down and try to come up with some sort of a conventional reason <laughs> And, you know, some sort of an explanation that we can all get behind. Oh, they used pulleys and pushed them on logs. Like, yeah. shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. Just shut the fuck up. What you're saying doesn't even make any goddamn sense. It's way more likely that there was incredibly sophisticated technology that existed. And it's way more likely, in face of the evidence of the Younger Dryas Impact Theory, yep. that that shit was wiped out. And that we're talking about a really advanced civilization that lived a long time ago. It's more advanced than we are today but moved in a different direction. Like we moved right. in the direction of combustion engines and electronics and, and they moved in some other direction, but achieved 
maybe many thousands of years more sophistication in that direction than we have with our internal combustion engines and electricity right. and yep. all the shit that we use. And it's important for people to understand that these primitive methods that are suggested and, and pushed very hard by the, quote, mainstream, they don't test any of these. Like, show me them moving, you know, a thousand tons stone on logs. Let's, right. let's see that. Uh, they don't show, they've never cut one single box, like you said, in half, or even completed one single average size box, or any box. I mean, yeah. When I say box, I'm talking about a stone block with the primitive methods. Well, show you have me. shown that they've moved that one 1,000 ton stone. Right. The Thunderstone, yeah. yeah. But, but there's no, well, again, they weren't using but it's railway not tracks nearly and ball bearings. Yeah. And a ball sophisticated, bearings. It's, but yeah. also the way it's constructed, it's yeah. just a rock. It's you, not right. like this amazing obelisk that's carved out of a mountain a thousand right. miles away. It's not, there's nothing like that. Right. There's, there's also no evidence for it in dynastic Egypt. That's the other thing. They can't the, the earliest parts of, look, this crazy thing about it is in the Old Kingdom, the, the, the mainstream archaeologists, there's some disagreement on this, but in general, they don't give them the, they don't grant them the ability to even quarry granite. They say that in the Old Kingdom, they couldn't quarry granite. They made all of their granite artifacts from surface granite. It's just, it's the most, it's the craziest thing. No, no wheel, no use of the wheel. Uh, never in the Egyptian civilization did they grant them the use of the pulley. It was, it was literally um, human horsepower, Ropes, levers, and wooden sleds. That's it. The Romans came along and the Greeks and they started using pulleys and force multipliers and stuff like that. But they don't, there's no evidence for that in the dynastic Egyptian have civilization. Have you ever had a conversation with all the information that you have at your disposal, like right off the top of your head? Have you ever had a conversation with a conventional archaeologist uh, that wants to argue this with you? On I mean, on email a couple of times, but not in life. What it's do they say on email? It's, it's. It's a lot of it. Is, I want to keep my job. That's what they say. <laughs> I think there's a bit of that. If you read my I textbook, it has all the answers. Shit. I shouldn't be an expert, but I, fuck you. Yeah. I, have, I bought a BMW, you piece yeah. of shit. You're trying to take it from I'm me. I'm tenured. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm they do, tenured. They say, like, oh, we know how they did it because they talk about it. So, for example, with the giant statues, right, there's, there's a scene on a wall. It's called the, the Duty Hotep image. And it shows the Egyptians, like it's all, you see these dudes in profile. It's an Egyptian drawing, definitely dynastics made the drawing. And there's 156 dudes when you count them all up and they're pulling a statue that's tied to a, to a, to a wooden sled. Now, we know this statue, there's parts of it still exist. First, it's alabaster. It's not granite. Second, it weighs about 56 tons. That's fine. And, and you're dragging it on a wooden sled. You can't use that to explain how you move a thousand ton statue. It's just, it's not like a sliding scale of difficulty. It's, it's a, you know, there's a, there's a curve to it. Like you can, you can move. I do grant them the ability to use primitive methods to move stuff up to like 100, 150 tons. But once you start getting to 400, 600, 1,000 tons, material failure, wood's not an issue, that literally sleds would just be crushed or driven into the ground. 